go. I'm curious, you guys. Uh, my parents are here visiting, which is amazing, but they're listen they're watching TV and it's quite loud. Are you hearing them behind me at all? Okay, yeah. I'm sounding good. Anything. So if I read, it won't distract. Let me just no, but you know what you can do too if you're nervous is <clears throat> change your audio settings. Really? Yeah, so go where it says mute and there's like the little carrot, like click uh -huh. that uh -huh. and go to audio settings. Audio and setting. Do you see where your input volume is? Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Uh, yes. Okay, where is it right now? The little uh, circle. It's pretty high. It's up. So just bring it down maybe halfway and let me hear your voice. Okay. How do you do that? How do I sound? Okay, that's a little too okay? low. A little too low. Okay, let me go up. Sounding better? That's I better. Think okay to begin with. I didn't even hear the TV. Okay. Okay. And it has a suppressed background noise too on medium or high. So maybe I'll do high. Oh, oh, wow. They ha you have to do an audio enhancement package for that. Forget it. Okay. I'll keep my medium. <laughs> I was just saying, Lauren, my, my parents are here visiting for the weekend. And oh, nice. so, which is great, but they're upstairs watching a show really loudly right now. And I'm like worried. What show I are they watching? I don't mom likes things I don't like uh crime and my mom too stuff like that <laughs> I can't watch I any them. of that stuff I'm like no I hate like, them. I was like why do I want to know about the details of these things and then I I feel like I'll have more fears unnecessarily I like exactly. those if they're fictional yeah <laughs> <laughs> It's garbage in, garbage out, now. is what I say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. If I suddenly start moving around, it's because I got kicked out of the library. So I'll stay on the call. You just might see me like getting <laughs> escorted out of here for talking. Okay, Diego. Well, because you made a special drawing for us. Oh, Lauren, week. wait, you see it. Show her. Oh, okay. We made a special incredible. just for this week's work or this week's reading. Um, oh. There we go. Can you see that? I can. Oh my God. Can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, I can yeah, hear you. Perfect. That's incredible. Look at that biogeo coenosis <laughs> diagram. <laughs> Thank I love you. that you're starting to incorporate the arrows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, it's a little jumbled up here, but, you know, so is it's, everything. It's beautiful. Thank you, Diego. How exciting. Of course, yeah. yeah. It's really fun. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Hi. Cindy. Sorry, I'm a little late. Oh, We're happy to see your pretty face. <laughs> yeah. We'll take what we can get. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Yeah, the arrows are cool. It's like I always think about Ooh, like how to. I like how that. To, what what that? drawing is this? I What'd you say, late. Cindy? I said I came in late. What what drawing is this? Oh, I made it for this week because of the reading. Ooh, I, I like know. it. But it's very like the first drawing I brought to your attention. Remember for bio yeah, geo exactly. Yeah, where we had like arrows that talked about water going down to the ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oxygen, that was totally but... on my mind when I was yeah, making this. I could tell. And the really other like one it. too. Yeah. It yeah. also looks like some crazy board game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do you get to, how do you get to the squirrel? Well, <laughs> you have to go to the century plant. But the century plant is connected to the exterior perimeter which is going around the drainage basin it's the it's the soil and the water that's the that's the exterior perimeter coming. i love in. it it's, you it's totally captured to it it's so hard to do to use a nonverbal visual flow chart like this yeah. yeah full of magical spirit animals and plants yeah yes. bravo well done thanks yes. i love it and I like the arrow coming from the rear end of the squirrel out into <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. an important part of the system. I didn't Probably even, I just learned that, that, any, that uh, when the squirrel died, the nutrients would go in the ground. But yeah, you're <laughs> yeah. totally right too. Should we let other people into our party? 
Yeah, I yeah, guess I guess, so. I guess we're just like going in. A... Okay, <laughs> it was four minutes ago it started. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> here we go. I'll let people in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Learning and Mending. I'm Jen, and I'm going to start with this week's Embroidery of the Week. And tonight, we have a beautiful mule fat that was done by Muriel Stern. And one of the reasons I selected this one is the beautiful shading detail that she did on the leaves. I thought that was extraordinary um, and really really gave it a lot of definition. So what we'll do now while we're waiting for people to come in to the Zoom is we'll do an introduction. I'll start and then we'll popcorn it to other people that are here on the Zoom. So as I said, my name's Jen. I am calling in from Studio City and I use she, her pronouns. And tonight I will be working, I hope to be finishing, but this um, mycelium carbon exchange network. Wow. So I, I'm just working on the outside of the, the microscope detailing right now. And I will pass this to Alex. Hi everyone, I'm calling in from uh, Marvissa and I am Alex Tanasi. I work at Metamelic Studio. And tonight I'm gonna to be working on the this uh, hermit thrush and yerba santa. I got some leaves going on. And uh, I'm gonna see how much fun I can get with this. And I will pass it to Diego. Hey, Alex. Um, I'm Diego. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm calling from Ithaca, New York. And um, today I'm just gonna be uh, sharing my screen and helping out with the readings. Um, I'll pass it to Millie. Hi everybody, I'm Millie. I'm calling in from Glassell Park. Um, I harvested this beautiful sage just a few hours ago. Uh, it's gonna be dedicated to, to our river construction, I believe, this week. Um, yeah, just, uh, it's really beautiful to share this time with you guys while we're reading at the same time and being outdoors, even though the weather's a little warm. I uh, go with she, her pronouns. And again, I'm calling from Glassell Park and I'll pass it on to Lauren. Hi, everybody. Lauren calling from Metabolic Studio, going by she, they pronouns. I'm working on these uh, notes from the underground series. <laughs> <laughs> uh, happy to be here tonight. So the loudest giggle is the next one. Olan Jones. <laughs> Hello, uh, Olam Jones using she, her pronouns, calling in from West Hollywood. I am working on my uh, paramecium from the depths. And, wow, um, very cool. <laughs> and Marianne, you're up next. I'm up, okay. Oh, I'm also unmuted, I didn't know that. Okay, I'm wearing, I, it's very pale. I don't know if you can see it, but. That's what I'm working on. I think I might do outline on this thing here today, or I might do some more browns. Anyway, I'm Marianne Maley. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm uh, zooming in from Silver Lake, and I'll be leaving a little early tonight. I'm really happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Let's see, who can I see? I only have one bar to my side. Cynthia Bautista. Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm calling in from West Covina. And I am also working on the, oh, uh, wait, where's that? Yeah, this underground pattern. Very cool. And um, I'm happy to be here. I will pass it on to James. Hi, everybody. Uh, James calling in from downtown Los Angeles. I go by he, him pronouns. And um, I am just at home because I was helping build a Hugel culture earlier and I'm tired, but I am excited to listen to tonight's reading. Um, 
I will pass it to Roxanne. Hi, I'm Roxanne. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm um, calling in from Malibu and I'm still working on this um, common raven. Um, but I have a question like, I don't understand how you get the embroidery to look like it's on top of of the fabric rather than knitted in. Like I see a lot of really great embroiders that look like it just kind of runs right on the surface. So that's my embroidery question. I think there's a stitch that you can just do that that you can go over. If next time you're at the studio rocks and I can I can try to help you with that. Cause I don't know what the name of the stitch is, but I think I can find it and either send you the link for it or we can do it together. Oh, that would be great. Maybe. Oh, you're breaking up. Okay. Um, I will pass it on to, oh, can you hear me? I'll pass it to Peggy. Thanks, Cindy. Hi, I'm Peggy and I'm call, uh, I go by she, her pro, pronouns and I'm calling from Los Angeles and uh, I'm new to this, so I'm not embroidering yet. I just not even sure exactly what's going on, but watching a little, I'll share that uh, today I received uh, a one, a 99 year old scrapbook from my three great, great aunts aunties, they call them, on a trip they took out west, and it says, flowers picked in Yellowstone Park, bluebells, clover, and forget-me-nots picked near a snow pile, July 16th, 1920. So, in lieu of a Wow, 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 wow. That's so cool. Very special. That's really day. cool. Wowza, wowza. What a special share, thank you. <laughs> Oh, and I will pass it on to, I'm intrigued by um, 424-109-9322. If that person hears me. No taking, okay. Uh, I will pass it on to, I can't read this easily. Uh, that might be Vicky, 424 might be Vicky. Pass it on to Vicky. <laughs> I think that was because um, I saw that number switch to Ansu. Oh, okay. How about Ansu? I, I pass it on to Ansu. Hi there. It's Vicky. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes, Vicky. We hear you. We hear you, Vicky. Yeah, I'm. I'm just on the phone. I'm not on Zoom, but I'm. Um, I'm working on uh, a mushroom. I guess one of the mushroom embroideries of you know the beginning of life look. And um, I'm calling in from uh, Santa Monica, California on the phone and I use uh, she her pronouns. And I can't call on anybody. <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> is, o is, is Olan there? I am and I have gone. So I will uh, pass it on to Simone. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Simone. Um, I'm calling in from Arizona now. I'm visiting my grandma. And I just saw this on Echo Art Space on Instagram. So I thought I'd come and check it out. And it's nice hearing everybody share. And my pronouns are she, her. And I'll pass it to, did Rowena go? Hi everyone, I'm Rowena Koenig, she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from Mid-City and I'm taking care of some chores while I listen in for the first part and then I'm gonna to switch to my Hermit Thrush. Good to see everyone. Rowena. I'll pass to uh, DeRainer. Hi, this is DeRainer. I'm calling in from, I don't know where I am. <laughs> Somewhere <laughs> in Los Angeles, I'm driving on my way home. And I'm listening in tonight. I go by she, her pronouns and happy to be here. And I can't see who's on. So Actually, see, I'll take it from here. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so tonight um, we will share with you an embroidery um, time-lapse video, which we've been doing this series, which is really wonderful. And this 
features a long and short stitch, which also kind of chimes into the embroider of the week in terms of like the shading details. So I will share that screen with you right now. And unfortunately this week, there's no great music. So we're just gonna have to pretend. Okay, let's see. Everybody see that? Da, 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 da. Oh, perfect. Somebody's gonna provide music? <laughs> just an opening. Yeah, that was great, perfect. <laughs> just a little opening. Look at, oh, look at that pretty pink. Hmm. It's really pretty and it gives such nice shading to it. Yeah. I like the the sound the sound of everybody chatting over the script. Yeah, but we'll, this will be a new thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. We can <laughs> comment about what we like <laughs> as it goes. Nice. Someone Pretty. sing some more. We're learning. We're mending. We're mending. We're learning. <laughs> We're learning, we're mending. <laughs> Do you have a backup? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> learn, men, learn, men. That's when we were getting our, our, our music together. I'm sorry, the video had to end for this week. Um, <laughs> but um, we will continue with next week. And um, so let me start with tonight's introduction. So believe it or not, I believe this is the eighth uh, learning and mending we're doing. Uh, the learning and mending series is now in its fifth iteration overall. In this series from micro to macro, we will be exploring the implications of an integrated form of systems thinking that allows us to think across all scales from particle, cell, brain, society, ecosystem to cosmic matter. From micro to macro, we'll build upon what we learned about from Anna Singh's disturbance ecology and have an emphasis on complexity, networks, and patterns of organization. Many of you have received embroidery kits from us of native plants, birds, and microscopic organisms that the Metabolic Studio is currently cultivating on its project sites. Taken as a collection, all the embroideries will collectively illustrate biogeochoanosis which describes the intimate association between living things and the physical environment. If you've not received an embroidery kit or would like another one, please send your name and mailing address to info at metabolicstudio.org. Tonight, we will share our screen and we encourage you to read a section of the text aloud with us. When there is a pause in the reading, please feel free to unmute yourself and begin where the last person left off. Silence is golden, and there is no pressure to fill the transitional spaces while we enjoy a breath and continue crafting. Feel free to jump in and continue reading at your comfort level. You don't have to read. It's also fine to enjoy listening. And now I will pass it over to Kelly. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everybody. Welcome. It is Ecology Week, which is my favorite week, as you can tell. Um, but so this week we're going to continue um, working through the systems view of life by Fritoff Capra. Um, he, he starts us out this week and he does what he does well, which is goes over the key concepts and, and principles that make up systems ecology, goes over a little of the history of ecology and how it's transformed over time. Um, looks at some important concepts like self-organization, which we've heard before, um, nested scales, talks about scales and things. So that's, that's a really nice kind of groundwork reading, I think. And then we have another reading tonight um, from Starhawk, who was, uh, you know, brought up some differing points of view last week. So it'll be interesting to kind of continue on with her writing and see what, what comes of it. Um, and, Starhawk goes over, well, actually, Freetop goes over Gaia theory in more depth, which is really nice. And then Starhawk picks it up and she also talks about um, kind of the dynamic interplay between consciousness, energy, and matter, and, and the patterns and how they might actually help us as individuals and, and uh, as communities make decisions and things like that. So, 
kind of a, an interesting segue from pre-talk uh, through that reading. And um, just so that we know what book we're reading, a, a little bit more about Starhawk, because I got intrigued last week after our conversation about who she is and, and her work. Um, so I dug a little deeper and found out, you know, that she is definitely a major voice in the feminist spirituality movement. And this book that we're reading um, called The Earth Path, um, the book blurb is, I'm just going to read it to you, just so you kind of know what book we're reading from to give us a little more context. Um, the blurb is um, that, okay, so America's most renowned witch and eco-feminist offers a sequel to her best. <laughs> so she considers herself a witch, you know. Um, Ecofeminist offers a sequel to her best-selling classic, The Spiral Dance, we weaving together the latest findings in environmental science with magical spells, chants, meditations, and group exercises. From the earliest times, respecting our interdependent relationship with nature has been the first step towards spirituality. Earth, air, fire, and water are four elements worshipped in many indigenous cultures and celebrated in earth-based spiritualities such as Wicca. In the Earth Path, America's best-known witch offers readers a primer on how to open our eyes to the world around us, respect nature's delicate balance, and draw upon its tremendous powers. So it's just just to give us a little context of that how that book is described and, and who she is. And um, this week, uh, I have some guiding questions that I will put in the chat like I normally do. Um, the first is, what ecological patterns or principles might be useful in helping to guide our decisions, both personally and collectively? And the second one is, in what ways can we learn to see and or feel deep time or vast metabolic feedback loops? That'll make more sense after we do the reading because vast metabolic feedback loops are discussed, which is exciting. Um, and so I will put that in the chat and remind us at the end. And now I will pass it to Diego who will share the first reading. All right, I'll start. I'll start us off, I guess. Um, and it starts where ecosystems come in all sizes, Lauren. Okay. Yeah. Ecosystems come in all sizes. <laughs> they may be as small as a rotting log or as large as an ocean. A basic principle of ecology is the recognition that ecosystems, like all living systems, form multi-level structures of systems nesting within other systems. At the largest levels, regional communities of plants and animals that extend over millions of square kilometers are known as biomes. Another terrestrial ecosystem Another ter among terrestrial ecosystems, ecologists have identified eight major biomes, tropical, temperate, and conifer forests, tropical savanna, temperate grassland, chaparral, shrubland, tundra, and desert. And finally, the largest ecological unit is the biosphere, the global sum of all ecosystems. According to Gaia theory, the biosphere is tightly coupled to the Earth's rocks, the lithosphere, the oceans, the hydrosphere, and atmosphere in such a way that together they form a self-regulating planetary system. In the 1950s, the American ecologist Eugene Odom wrote the first ecology textbook, Fundamentals of Ecology, 
in which the basic principles and concepts of ecology were discussed for the first time in a clear and systematic exposition. Odum's text influenced a whole generation of ecologists. In addition to the lucid and detailed discussions of fundamental ecological concepts, the book also provides an overview of the main branches of ecology according to the habitat studied. Freshwater ecology, marine ecology, and terrestrial ecology. Odom's textbook was co-authored in part with his brother, Howard Odom, and together the Odom brothers pub also published several studies of ecosystems in which they documented the movement of energy and materials through the system in a series of flow diagrams. Such Odom flow diagrams have since become standard practice in the analysis of ecosystems. Branches of ecology. As ecologists developed and refined the basic concepts discussed in the previous section, they organized the various branches of their science accordingly. Thus, population ecology is concerned with the structure, spatial distribution, growth, and migrations of animal and plant populations. Evolutionary ecology is the study of the natural selection and evolution of populations. And community ecology is concerned with species interactions, focusing especially on understanding the nature and consequences of biodiversity within ecological communities. Recent advances in science and technology, for example, aerial photography and satellite imagery, as well as increasing concern about human impacts on the environment, gave rise to several new branches of ecology. These include conservation ecology, concerned with the maintenance of biological diversity, human ecology, which studies the wide range of relationships between humans and the natural environment, and global ecology, concerned with ecological phenomena on a global scale. Within our conceptual framework of the systems view of life, we shall discuss two areas of ecology in some detail. The first is ecosystem ecology, also known as systems ecology. The theoretical study of the structure and dynamics of, I don't know if it's ecosystems or ecosystems. Um, somebody tell me that. The, the second is human ecology, which includes critical issues like sustainability and the global manifestation of climate change. Systems ecology. Systems ecology or ecosystem ecology is concerned with the ecosystem as an integrated and interactive system of biological and physical components. Hence, this branch of ecology should reflect most explicitly the systems view of life we have been discussing throughout this book. In this section, we shall examine to what extent this is actually the case. To do so, we list below the basic systemic characteristics of biological life, as we discussed in chapters seven and eight so as to determine whether ecosystems satisfy those characteristics. Characteristics of biological life. Number one, a living system is materially and energetically open. It is a dissipative structure operating far from equilibrium. There is a continual flow of energy and matter through the system. Number two, it is self-organizing, its structure being organized by the system's own internal rules. Number three, its dynamics are non-linear and may include the emergence of new order at, cri at critical points of instability. Number four, it is operationally closed, an autopoetic bounded network. Number five, it is self-generating. Each component helps to transform and replace other components, including those of 
those of its semi-permeable boundary. Number six, its interactions with the environment are cognitive, that is determined by its own internal organization. Ecosystems as dissipative structures. When we look at the literature of systems ecology, we can easily see that ecologists so far have concentrated almost exclusively on the first three of these characteristics. Ever since the pioneering studies of Howard Odom, the flows of energy and matter through the ecosystem from the sun, the atmosphere, and the soil to primary producers, consumers, and decomposers have been the main subject of systems of ecology. Ecosystem energetics are analyzed within the framework of thermodynamics in terms of nutrient pools and fluxes, food chains, food webs, and trophic levels, and decomposition and nutrient cycling. In these analysis, ecologists realized early on that an ecosystem is materially and energetically open, its main energy source being the sun, and its net waste, the heat energy of respiration, radiated into the atmosphere. In addition, the nonlinear nature of all tropic, trophic dynamics was appreciated with the recognition of the food web as a basic pattern of organization in ecosystems. Accordingly, systems ecologists soon began to pay attention to the phenomenon of self-organization. As a molecular biologist and historian of science, Evelyn Fox Keller, 2005, points out, it is helpful to distinguish between different meanings of the term self-organization during different periods of modern science when discussing its application to ecosystems. To the cyberneticists in the 1940s, self-organization meant the spontaneous emergence of order in machines featuring feedback loops, which were conceived as models of living systems. This idea was used just a few years after its inception to analyze self-regulating and self-balancing mechanisms in ecosystems in a classic paper by Evelyn Hutchinson in 1948 titled Circular Causal Systems in Ecology. A few decades later, the cybernetic concept of self-organization was explored extensively in the flow diagrams introduced by Howard Odom. With the advent of complexity theory in the 1980s, the original cybernetic conception of self-organization changed. Self-organization now came to mean the spontaneous emergence of new order and complex systems governed by nonlinear dynamics. However, as we have emphasized feedback, oops, <laughs> emphasized feedback, both self-balancing and self-amplifying is still an important feature of these processes of emergence in dynamic systems. In this more recent conception of self-organization, ecosystems are understood as dissipative structures operating far from equilibrium and the, no oh, sorry, and the forms of new order are represented by mathematically by attractors emerging at bifurcation points. Due to its complexity and mathematical sophistication, this conceptual framework is much more challenging and ecologists have begun only recently to use it in their analysis of ecosystems. Are ecosystems autopoietic? Poetic? Is anybody? No, I'm gonna go. 
Nevertheless, our first three characteristics of biological life have all been applied successfully by systems ecologists to study of ecosystem structures and processes. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about the other three characteristics relating to autopoiesis. In fact, the concept of autopoiesis is glaringly absent from the literature on systems ecology. For example, in a multi-author book titled Theoretical Studies of Ecosystems, The Network Perspective, the editors state in their pref preface the diversity of viewpoints and approaches for theoretical study of ecosystems that are collected here share the perception of ecosystems as networks and represent the state of the art. But the question of whether these networks are self-generating or autopoietic is not discussed by any of the book's authors, nor is it addressed in another multi-author book, Handbook of Ecosystem Theories and Management published a decade later. Perhaps this should not be too surprising since the theory of autopoiesis is still not broadly accepted in mainstream biology, even though it has been embraced enthusiastically in many biological niches. As we have mentioned, Maturana and Varela originally proposed that the concept of autopoiesis should be restricted to the description of cellular networks and that the broader concept of operational closure, which does not specify production processes, should be applied to all other living systems. Other authors distinguish between first order unicellular and second order multicellular autopoiesis. And in our discussion, we suggest that biological life might be seen as a system of interlocking autopoietic systems. We have also reviewed the very lively debate on autopoiesis in social systems, which is in stark contrast to the almost total silence on the question of autopoiesis in ecosystems. It may well be that the pathways and processes in ecological networks are not yet known in sufficient detail to decide whether these networks can be described as autopoietic. However, it would certainly be in, as interesting to engage in discussions on autopoiesis with the ecologist as it has been with social scientists. To begin with, we can say that a function of all components in a food web is to transform other components within the same network. As plants take up inorganic matter from their environment to produce organic compounds, and as these compounds are passed on through the ecosystem to serve as food for the production of more complex structures, the entire network regulates itself through the multiple feedback loops. Individual components of the food web continually die. To be decomposed, and replaced by the network's own process of transformation. Whether this is sufficient to find an ecosystem as autopoietic remains to be seen and will depend, among other things, on a clear understanding of the system's boundary. The defining feature of an autopoietic system is that it, that it continually recreates within a boundary of its own making. In a cell, for example, the membrane surrounding the cell is continually regenerated and maintained by internal, internal cellular processes. And it contributes to these processes in turn by regulating the flow of nutrients from the cell's environment. In ecosystems, the situation is less clear cut. To begin with, there are several different boundaries. The atmosphere, the soil, the boundary between a small ecosystem nesting inside a larger one, and the boundaries between large scale ecosystems or patches as they are called in landscape ecology. How these different boundaries influence the functioning of the corresponding ecosystems 
and in particular, how they affect the flows of materials through them is still poorly understood. According to Gaia theory, the atmosphere is tightly coupled to life on Earth. It's gases being continually removed and replenished by living organisms. On the other hand, the atmosphere may be seen as semi-permeable, not unlike a cellular membrane, since it lets through certain frequencies of sunlight, but absorbs others while also protecting the biosphere from the high energy cosmic rays. Hence, it may be argued that the atmosphere cons constitutes a boundary in the sense of autopoiesis. However, whether this notion can be applied to a particular ecosystem and the portion of the atmosphere above it seems debatable and whether a similar argument can be made for the soil between a terrestrial ecosystem and the Earth's crust is even less evident. As far as the boundaries between patches in the landscape are concerned, the situation here is quite different from the, membrane, from the membranes surrounding cells. In a multicellular organism, each cell has its own membrane and the cells are interlinked by so-called protein channels through which they exchange chemical and electrical signals. Adjacent ecosystems, by contrast, share a single boundary, which may have some characteristics in common with one or other patch, or may be completely distinct. These boundaries may be wide or narrow, depending on the gradients of changing characteristics from one patch to another. For example, if a meadow adjacent to a forest is mown close to the trees, the boundary may be very narrow. But if parts of the meadow near the trees are left, are left unmown, the transition between grasses and trees may be more gradual and thus the boundary much wider with shrubs and young trees growing at the interface. In both cases, the boundary will influence the flows of materials, organisms, and energy between the two patches. However, it is far from clear how this regulation of flows can be associated with either one or the other ecosystem in the sense of autopoiesis. We conclude from these considerations that the question of whether and how exactly the concept of autopoiesis applies to ecosystems is still wide open and well worth in-depth discussions within the conceptual framework of systems ecology. autopoiesis and the Gaia system. When we shift our perception from ecosystems to the planet as a whole, we encounter a global network of processes of production and transformation, which has been described in some detail in the Gaia theory by James Lovelock and Lynn Marguelis. In fact, there are, seems to be more evidence for the autopoietic nature of the Gaia system than, all, than for ecosystems. The Earth system operates on a very large scale in space and also involves very long time scales. It is thus not so easy to think of Gaia as being alive in a concrete manner. Is the whole planet alive or just certain parts? And if the latter, which parts? To help us picture Gaia as a living system, Lovelock has suggested a redwood tree as an analogy. As a tree grows, there is only a thin layer of living cells known as the cambium around its perimeter just beneath the bark. All the wood inside, more than 97% of the tree, is dead. Similarly, the earth is covered with a thin layer of living organisms, the biosphere, reaching down into the ocean about 8 to 9.6 kilometers by 5 to 6 miles and up into the atmosphere about the same distance. Thus, the living part of the of Gaia is but a thin film around the globe. 
just as the bark of a tree protects the tree's thin layer of living tissues from damage. Life on Earth is surrounded by the protective layer of the atmosphere, which shields us from ultraviolet light and other harmful influences and keeps the planet's temperature within a range appropriate for life to flourish. Neither the atmosphere above us nor the rocks below us are alive, but both have been shaped and transformed considerably by living organisms, just like the bark and the wood of the tree. Outer space and the in interior are both part of Gaia's environment. According to Gaia theory, the Earth's atmosphere is created, transformed, and maintained by the biosphere's metabolic processes. Bacteria play a crucial role in these processes, influencing the rate of chemical reactions and thus acting as a biological equivalent of enzymes in a cell. As we have mentioned, the atmosphere is semi-permeable, like a cell membrane. It forms an integral part of the planetary network. For example, it created the protective greenhouse in which early life on, planet, on the planet was able to unfold three billion years ago. Even through the sun, even though the sun was then 25% less luminous than it is now. The Gaia system is clearly self-generating. The planetary metabolism converts inorganic substances into organic living matter and back into soil, oceans, and air. All components of the Gaian theory or Gaia network, including those of its atmospheric boundary, are produced by processes within the network. A key characteristic of Gaia is the complex interweaving of living and non-living systems within a single web. This results in a feedback loop known to ecologists as biogeochemical cycles of vastly differing scales. They may extend over hundreds of millions of years while the organisms associated with them have very short lifespans. The CO2 cycle is an impressive illustration of such a giant feedback loop. The Earth's volcanoes have spewed out huge amounts of CO2 for millions of years. Since CO2 is one of the main greenhouse gases, Gaia needs to pump it out of the atmosphere, which otherwise would get too hot for life. Plants and animals recycle massive amounts of CO2 and oxygen in the processes of photosynthesis, respiration, and decay. However, these exchanges are always in balance and do not affect the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. According to Gaia theory, the excess of CO2 in the atmosphere is removed and recycled by a vast feedback loop, which involves rock weathering as a key ingredient. In the process of rock weathering, silicate rocks, granite and basalt, combine with rainwater and CO2 to form various chemicals known as carbonates. The CO2 is thus taken out of the atmosphere and bound in liquid solutions. These are purely chemical processes that do not require the participation of life. However, Lovelock and others discovered that the presence of soil bacteria, fungi, lichens, and plants vastly increases the rate of rock weathering. In a sense, these organisms act as biological catalysts for the process of rock weathering. The carbonates are then washed down into the ocean where tiny algae, invisible to the naked eye, absorb them and use them to make exquisite shells of chalk, calcium carbonate. So the CO2 that was in the atmosphere has now ended up in the shells of those minute algae. In addition, ocean algae also absorb CO2 directly from the air. When the algae die, their shells rain down to the ocean floor where they form massive sediments of chalk and limestone, both forms of calcium carbonate. Thanks to plate tectonics, these sediments gradually sink into the mantle of the earth and melt, whereupon some of the CO2 contained in the molten rocks is spewed out again by volcanoes and sent on another round in the Great Gaian Cycle. The entire cycle linking volcanoes to silicate rock weathering, to soil bacteria, to oceanic algae, to limestone sediments, and back to volcanoes acts as a giant feedback loop, which contributes to the regulation of the Earth's temperature. As the sun gets hotter, the growth of organisms on the rocks and in the soil is stimulated, which increases the rate of rock weathering. 
This in turn pumps more CO2 out of the atmosphere and thus cools the planet. According to Lovelock and Marguerites, similar feedback cycles interlinking plants and rocks, animals and atmospheric gases, and microorganisms in the oceans regulate the Earth's climate, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, and other important planetary conditions. In the Gaia system, the components of the oceans, soil, and air, as well as all the organisms of the biosphere, are continually replaced by the planetary processes of production and transformation. It seems, therefore, that the case for Gaia being an autopoetic network is very strong. Indeed, Lynn Margulis, co-author of the Gaia theory, asserted confidently, there is little doubt that the planetary patina, including ourselves, is autopoetic. The confidence of Margulis in the idea of a planetary autopoetic web stemmed from three decades of pioneering work in microbiology. To understand the complexity, diversity, and self-organizing capabilities of the Gaian network, an understanding of the microcosm, the nature, extension, metabolism, and evolution of microorganisms is absolutely essential. Life on Earth began around 3.5 billion years ago, and for the first 2 billion years, the living world consisted entirely of unicellular microorganisms. During the first billion years of evolution, bacteria, the most basic forms of life, covered the planet with an intricate web of metabolic processes and began to regulate the temperature and chemical composition of the atmosphere so that it became conducive to the evolution of higher forms of life. Plants, animals, and humans are latecomers to the earth, having emerged from the microcosm less than 1 billion years ago. And even today, the visible living organisms function only because of their well-developed connections with the bacterial web of life. Far from leaving microorganisms behind on an evolutionary ladder, wrote Margulis and Sagan, we are both surrounded by them and composed of them. We have to think of ourselves in our environment as an evolutionary mosaic of microcosmic life. During life's long evolutionary history, over 99% of all species that ever existed have become extinct. But the planetary web of bacteria has survived continuing to regulate the conditions for life on Earth as it has for the past 3 billion years. According to Margulis, the concept of a planetary autopoetic network is justified because all life is embedded in a self-organizing web of bacteria involving elaborate networks of sensory and control systems, which we are only beginning to recognize. Myriads of bacteria living in the soil, the rocks and the oceans, as well as inside all plants, animals, and humans, continually regulate life on Earth. It is the growth, metabolism, and gas exchanging properties of microbes that form the complex physical and chemical feedback systems which modulate the biosphere in which we live. And since the system's view of life defines these self-organizing processes ultimately as cognitive, the microbial web of life must be considered a cognitive system. Great, I think that's where we end this reading, Diego. Um, I know I, when I saw that this was the end, I was like, but I wanna read about ecological sustainability. <laughs> we'll have to do that another day. Um, so I think we're gonna just take a little break. We have a nice diagram that Diego put together for, drew by hand for us to kind of bring these concepts to life. And, and he's going to take a moment to also talk, connect these kind of theoretical writings to more local ecologies and, and learnings that he's been doing. So we'll just have a little, a little break for a minute with Diego. Thanks, Kelly. Let me just pull it up. Did that work? Yeah, so I made this drawing because um, 
uh, I was thinking about it in the reading when they mentioned the, uh, the Odom flow diagrams. This is basically one of those, but I just use species that are found um, around us uh, in the San Gabriel Mountains. So you have mule deer, you have trailside grasshoppers, honey mushrooms, um, California ground squirrel, mountain lion, poison oak, laurel sumac, uh, chaparral yucca, side blotch lizard, California scrub jay, acorn woodpecker, live oak, just lots of stuff all over the place. And uh, the arrows are pointing, they're showing the, the movement of, of energy and material through the system. Um, if you can see around, <laughs> I just realized I was using my finger to point on the screen. Um, these arrows here are representing the, um, the atmospheric and climatic conditions that are affecting the system. Um, which affect the soil composition, the weathering, the moisture available to plants, which then through here um, is responsible for generating the soil and the nutrient base that gives rise to fungi, gives rise to um, plants, primary producers that take their energy from the sun. Um, and then these are variously linked to the secondary consumers, or the, I mean, yeah, the secondary consumers primary consumers, sorry, primary producers are the ones that take their energy from the sun. Primary consumers are the ones that eat the ones that take their energy from the sun. And secondary consumers, something like this mountain lion here, um, are the ones that eat the primary consumers. Um, I thought this was just a fun way to visualize what the reading was saying. Um, one thing that I did think about was uh, with the idea of autopoiesis, um, it really sank in reading it that second time, but, um, you know, delineating a boundary between ecosystems is really hard to do. And I don't think that it really can be done. I don't think that you can say that um, any of the systems are, are closed off within a boundary or um, are entirely self-contained and self-regulating. But the reading did sort of mention that, and it seemed like that that's the part that I had trouble understanding was, um, the reference to both the, the open-endedness, the semi-permeable membrane, and then the operational closeness that defines autopoiesis. Um, I can see it though with the entire planetary system because you know beyond that there isn't a isn't a, a boundary that it could could ever grade into. Um, so yeah. Diego, this diagram is like, isn't it true pictures worth a thousand words? <laughs> it's just like, you know, all of that reading really was pointing to this, like, you know, that the dynamics, the exchange, these invisible networks connecting all these, these organisms into a whole, that's what the whole autopoiesis thing is. I think it's great what you said about, um, you know, boundaries between ecosystems are really hard to define. Um, there are also very interesting spaces that are, you know, when we think about ecotones that, are, that are where different ecosystems do meet and exchange and you have lots of diversity because of that meeting place. So the boundary actually is, is a meeting place of diversity. And so it's it's a little different than how we think of boundaries traditionally, where it's like, there's a hard boundary here, a line, you know, it's a gradient. And so I think recognizing that boundaries are fictitious in that way, <laughs> especially in terms of, of ecosystems is interesting. Um, and yeah, it's just love your drawing. So, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, you know, this whole thing, this whole diagram, the, the system that's drawn here could very well itself, you could draw an arrow like this pointing to a whole nother set of relationships because this action, this community, these interactions here are affecting the, the composition of nutrients, the, the collection of moisture in the air, like the, the distribution of of species and implications that that has for, uh, you know, where populations can or can't make a living. So each one of these systems are really closely tied to and are themselves inputs to other systems. Yeah. 
I don't, you know what, the word autopoiesis, I mean, I can't, I'm, I'm still fuzzy about it because I know we, it's used a lot and it's the foundational concept, but do you mind Diego or Kelly just kind of covering over the definition of that again? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can do it, Kelly, if you want. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and I'll supplement it. I'll try it because I'm figuring it out myself. It's, yeah, me too, me too. Um, I think it really made sense to me what they meant by it when they talked about, um, or when he talked about uh, the entire planetary system, you know, being more closely fitting the definition of autopoiesis. I think that, that what they mean is that um, the contents of you have a boundary so at the planetary level it's like the atmosphere is the outer boundary the biosphere is, is within that um and it the boundary itself is produced by the interactions of its components and then in turn affects determines creates the presence of the components in the first place or simultaneously as they form it so it's that kind of linkage, which, you know, is, is necessarily true. Like you, that, the only thing that I get hung up on is where the boundary is decided. Like there is no boundary between the reading mentioned that, the, that it's not evident what the boundaries are. There are no boundaries between um, flows of energy, material organisms um, all over the place. You do have concentrations like regional patterns here and there but that's not really a a, a closed system did that oh. help you at all Ansu? Or? Yeah, yeah I, I got that from the context but you know I, I don't know if um this term autopoiesis has work has an independent sort of definition and then it's applied in this context or why had they used it yeah well i mean just to interrupt a sec i looked in the merriam webster dictionary and it is listed as a noun so um in its <laughs> uh in its definition here they give a few definitions one of which is a quote from lynn margolis what is life and another from Francesco Varela that we read from 1981. So they're, they're, um, they're acknowledging that it is a like word, but at the same time, um, it seems like it's a relatively new word that's um, been hybridized from two different um, concepts, both auto or self and poesis, which is like generating. Okay, yeah, that, that helps, yeah. Yeah, and, and just to add a couple things, it seems to me it was like an attempt to understand what is living versus non-living. It's like, like a hard thing, it's a hard line to draw, like what's alive and not. And I think autopoiesis kind of was born out of trying to answer what is a fundamental characteristic of life, which is this self-generative capacity to create conditions. Yeah, Lauren's giving me thumbs up. Okay, good, I'm on the right track. Um, and it seems it was born to try to differentiate what it is that life does on the planet and and you know you think about Gaia theory and how life is actually creating the atmosphere this envelope to that is you know again like nourishing back into into life again um but I will also just mention again and I know I've talked about it before that other that thinkers since the time when autopoiesis came to the forefront have also brought up the fact of like that there's maybe another conception of it called sympoesis, which is, I think it's, a, it might come down to linguistics because self creation is actually a fallacy in a way because every cell has mitochondria in it, which is another organism. So we're actually 
there is some boundary around a cell, but it's a collaborative endeavor at every at every scale when you really look at it. So it's it's interesting that you know the whole the evolution of the concept. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> it does, it does. Can you hear me when I'm muted? Um, good. Yeah. It does seem like, like that definition being what it is could lie within the definition of other words that are used to describe the same thing, basically. Like that the principle of self-organization and, and like the unique, metabolic properties of living systems are summarized like you, you could use lots of other words besides autopoiesis to describe those things that also indicate more than sort of this um really particular usage of autopoiesis like like sympoiesis for example or vast, what I like, I, vast metabolic networks across long durations of time. That was my, <laughs> I like that one too. <laughs> okay, maybe in the interest of time, we better dive into Starhawk. She's going to take us in a whole new, well, not a whole new direction. This one is definitely related, but a different style of writing for sure. One morning, I was sitting on my back deck, meditating on the question of how to make change in the world. The forest was all around me, and I was asking the question, can you change a system from within or from without? Systems don't change from within, I heard the forest say. Systems try to maintain themselves. I figured that the forest, being a complex system itself, ought to know. But to say, the forest told me, is already to create a simplified frame. It's a frame I find useful. It's a way of perceiving that's comfortable for my human awareness and allows me to hear something I might otherwise miss. But it is also a simplification of a larger framework, one that might perceive me and my mind and my question and the forest around me and the moment that includes my long-term relationship with that part particular spot as a whole, in which my mind and the forest mind are not separate beings talking to each other, but one process that together produce that insight. Magic is itself a framework. Indeed, human beings cannot walk around, function, and continue to tie our shoes without putting some kind of simplified frame around the overwhelming whole of the world. Perhaps only enlightenment, in, <clears throat> excuse me. Perhaps, perhaps only enlightened Buddhas can try, can truly remove all frames from the world and exist in ultimate reality. What follows is my own framework, my understanding of the values and principles that derive from a goddess-centered view of the world. But of course, part of the essence of that view is respect for diversity and for the spiritual authority inherent in each person. Other witches and goddess theologians, they feel like theologians instead of theos as in God, they frame values and issues very differently. Magic teaches us to be aware that we are viewing the world through a frame warns us not to confuse it with ultimate reality or mistake the map for the, for the territory. Moreover, part of our magical discipline is to make conscious choices about which frame we adopt.
As soon as we start making choices, we have entered the realm of values. The criteria we use for choosing one frame over another come from what we ultimately value most, what we consider sacred. To consider something sacred is to say that it's profoundly important, that it has value in and of itself that goes beyond our immediate comfort or convenience, that we don't want to see it diminished or denigrated in any way. The word sacred comes from the same root of as sacrifice, because to choose any one value is to relinquish another. If something is sacred to us, we are valuing or we are willing to sacrifice something to protect it, willing to take a stand or to risk ourselves in its service. We don't idolize sacrifice, however, idealize sacrifice, however, I, aligning ourselves with what is truly sacred means serving those things that are also feed and renew us, that give us the greatest joy and pleasure that evoke our deepest love. As witches, we have a huge responsibility because of, we are the polytheists. We see many great powers and constellations of energies in the universe that we call goddesses and gods, and we choose which we will worship or ally ourselves with. We do also see the underlying unity and oneness of the universe, but being a polytheist is a way of acknowledging that no one name or description or spiritual path can do justice to that immense whole. Gods and goddesses and sacred texts and religions are all frames, descriptions, maps. No one of them is the whole landscape itself. But if we have no sacred texts, no Ten Commandments, no ultimate authority, how do we know what to value? If we don't see the world as a simple battle of good versus evil, but as an interplay of forces and counterforces as seeking a dynamic equilibrium on what to do or what do we on what we <laughs> on what do we base our ethics? If we see the world as a dynamic whole, then the first question we might ask when we face the choice is how does this action or decision impact the whole? That's not a simple question to answer because the whole is beyond our complete knowledge and acts have unexpected consequences. And how do we know if an effect is beneficial or not? Since Earth base spirituality takes nature as its frame we can look to natural systems as a model to understand whether something is beneficial we need to understand what constitutes health in a natural system and to know something about how ecosystems work a healthy ecosystem might be one that is characterized by cooperative and independent relationships amongst its members and that it is diverse and complex enough to be resilient to maintain itself in the face of change. Energy and resources are spread throughout the system so that diversity can thrive. No more energy or resources are used to maintain the system than coming from the sun or are generated by the life process of the system itself members of the ecological community are free to express in their unique ways to the great creative energies of the universe. Although we often think of nature as red in touch, in tooth and claw, a field of ruthless competition for survival, today's more sophisticated understanding of ecology sees an enormous amount of cooperation and interdependence. In a forest, trees grow in conjunction with microfossil fungi that interpret the root hairs and extend their ability to take in food and nutrients. Voles and flying squirrels eat the fungi and, and excrete the spores spreading them throughout the woods. 
Through the network of fungi, trees can nurture their own young, and trees in the sun share nutrients with trees in the shade, even though, even those of different species. In a natural system, the right level of diversity and complexity increases health and resilience. A prairie, which might have hundreds of species of grass, forbs, are broad-leafed plants, legumes and flowers in a single square yard is far more diverse than a field of genetically engineered corn. If a new disease air air rises, it might affect one or a few of the prairie plants, but hundreds of others would survive. The ground would still be covered. The billions of soil, bacteria, and the worms below ground would still live. But if a new disease attacks the modified corn plants, they might all die. The exposed soil would erode with devastating consequences to the below soil life. But that healthy diversity lies within a certain spectrum. If we try to increase it by planting bananas and mangoes in an Iowa prairie, obviously these newcomers would die because they require different growing conditions. Healthy diversity is the maximum diversity that can adapt to the local conditions of life. Those differences in local adaptation create the larger mosaic of biodiversity over the, whole, over the earth whole. Abundance or the provision of resources and energy so that members of an ecological community can thrive is also a value. Abundance is constrained by sustainability. The need for a system to be replenishing, to not consume more than it can create. The margin of abundance is the free gift of the sun's energy, which is constantly showered on the earth. The only true margin of profit that exists. To benefit the whole, that abundance must be spread around and shared and not concentrated so that a few elements have most or all of the resources and others lack what they need. Freedom and creativity are perhaps human values, but they are also aspects of a healthy natural system. A healthy system is dynamic, not static, ever changing and adapting and evolving. If members of an eco community are controlled or restricted from expressing their potential or making choices, their ability to adapt is limited. Life has shown again and again that it is enormously creative and, al and alignment with that creativity is one of the marks of health. There are other human values that we might want to include in our definition of what constitutes benefit, love, compassion, gratitude, joy, all characteristics that arise in the presence of a healthy, vibrant whole. But love and compassion are more. We might think of them as part of the earth whole's immune response to disease. They are the emotions that mobilize us as human beings to care for and nurture something, to heal a hurt, to right a wrong. When a system is whole and healthy, when it is based on relationships of interdependence and cooperation, that further resilience, diversity, abundance, sustainability, creativity, and freedom, it exhibits that balance we humans call justice.
Once we have a model in our minds for what health looks and feels like, we can ask ourselves when contemplating any act or decision, will this create beneficial relationships? Answering this question, like the earlier questions, is not as simple as it might seem, because to decide if a relationship is beneficial, especially to the whole, we need to understand something about how systems work. Magic has some guiding principles to offer, and so do systems theory, permaculture, and ecology. What follows is a synthesis of all of these. The interplay of consciousness, comma, energy, and form. The universe is a whole made up of many smaller holes, circles within circles. How we define those holes and draw their boundaries profoundly affects how we perceive them and how energy moves within them. The world is an interplay between consciousness, energy, and matter or form. We know that energy can be transformed into matter and that the atoms of matter can be split to release enormous energy. Matter certainly affects consciousness. Try being happy when you don't have enough to eat or feeling a great sense of well-being while being hit on the head. Consciousness also affects matter. Some decisions I've made, some images in my mind, is moving me to hit you on the head. <laughs> uh, magic teaches us that consciousness can direct energy in both overt and subtle ways, and that energy flows set the patterns that result in manifestations or form. Because everything is interdependent, there is no simple single causes and effects. Every action creates not just an equal and opposite reaction, but a web of reverberating consequences. Everything we do affects the whole. Every whole is made up of an interplay between consciousness, energy, and form. The universe is infused with consciousness, is consciousness, shifting and changing and dancing. Every consciousness is always communicating. The more we are open to ourselves, the more we open ourselves to hear and understand that communication, the more we can begin to speak back. The language of that communication may not be words. It may be emotions, energies, sense, images, or events. In speaking back, we also need to move beyond words. How energy moves. Energy moves in cycles, circles, spirals, vortexes, whirls, pulsations, waves, and rhythms, rarely, if ever, in simple straight lines. Abundance in a system comes not just from how much energy or resources flow in, but how many times that energy and those resources recirculate before flowing out. If the water you use to wash your dishes is reused to water the garden, you have double the amount of effective water. In an abundant system, waste is food, pollution is an unused resource. Some of those cycles are self-constraining. In systems theory, these are called negative feedback cycles, but people who associate negative feedback with criticism find that term confusing. Self-constraining or self-regulating cycles work like the temperature regulation system in your body. When you get too hot, you begin to sweat and the evaporation of the sweat cools you down. When you get too cold, you begin to shiver to warm up. Your body generally does a good job of maintaining an equilibrium, a base temperature. Living systems are characterized by many self-constraining cycles. Gaia as a planetary organism also includes self-regulating cycles. 
Other cycles are self-reinforcing or self-amplifying. In systems theory, these are called positive feedback cycles, although their effects are not always positive. Self-reinforcing cycles, you can work like a good composting system. I compost my garden and kitchen wastes, which produces more fertility in the garden, which produces more wastes to compost and so on. Or they can work like an addiction. I drink too much, so I don't show up at work, so I get fired, so I feel bad about myself, so I drink more and so on. While self-constraining cycles help maintain equilibrium, self-reinforcing cycles are driving engines for change for better or worse. Sometimes self-reinforcing cycles continue until the system reaches a new equilibrium. For example, I reach the absolute limit of how much my garden can produce at a heightened level of fertility. Sometimes when they have negative effects, they continue until the system crashes, having used up its available resources. For example, I run out of unemployment insurance, friends I can borrow from and couches I can stay on, and I hit rock bottom as an alcoholic. Energy imbalances in a system create turbulence, movement in spirals and vortexes, which evens out the spread of energy throughout the system. Diego, is there another page? No. There is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's three more pages. Okay. Let's do this. Form and matter. Form reflects underlying flows of energy. Nature is full of patterns or forms that repeat because they reflect ways that energy flows. Spheres, circles, branches, spirals, waves, and radials are common patterns. Trees, river systems, and the blood in our veins share a branching pattern. Snail shells and pea tendrils spiral. Water, light, and sand dunes travel in waves. Observing, understanding, and using these patterns can help us direct energy more effectively and create healthier systems. Form is more rigid, fixed, and resistant to change than energy. The health and function of a system depend not just on what is there, but on where each element is in relation to everything else. And on, when we, uh, and on when each element enters and leaves the system. The right thing in the wrong place or at the wrong time can be devastating. When something is in the right place at the right time, it can perform more than one function. A comfrey plant in the midst of your most fertile garden bed will take over and crowd out your vegetables. But on the edge of your garden, it can serve as a barrier to encroaching grass and provide you with medicinal poultices and healing herb tea. And that's not all. It can reclaim lost nutrients from the deep soil layers. Its leaves make an excellent mulch or addition to the compost pile and a good chicken fodder. Fermented, they produce a juice that can be diluted and used as a liquid fertilizer or foliar feed for plants. Comfrey flowers feed bees and are beneficial and other beneficial insects and are a delicious addition to salad. In, abundance, in an abundant system, each element performs multiple functions. We can do more with less, as Buckminster Fuller was fond of saying. In a secure and stable system, each necessary function is performed by more than one element. If one thing fails, a backup can perform its function. Making beneficial choices. 
these principles may seem abstract, but throughout this book, we will be seeing examples of how they manifest and how we might apply them. But for now, let's go back to our discussion of values and decisions, knowing what we mean by beneficial and coming from some basic understandings about how consciousness, energy, and matter work, how might we apply these two choices we make? We make, we each make these we each make decisions all the time, small ones and large ones. Do I spend an extra dollar to buy the organic tomatoes? If I consider the impact on the whole, on my own health and the health of the whole system, and I have the dollar, then yes, I do. Do I spend the time and effort to grow tomatoes of my own? If I were to pay myself for the hours I spend gardening, account for all the money and effort and thought I expend, each tomato probably cost me $30 or more if I decide to raise my hourly rate. Terrible value for the money. But if I'm looking at more than the tomatoes, at the whole of what I need and value and take pleasure in, the value of the fertile, healthy soil I cultivate in order to grow tomatoes, the seven-year-old who lives in our house and likes to pick them off the vine and the introduction it gives her to nature and the garden, the joy the bees take in the borage that grows with the tomatoes and the fruit, the bees pollinate, the positive relationship with my friend, Brooke, who adores the green tomatoes, chutney I make, the uncountable value of eating something I have a real relationship with, then growing tomatoes is obviously of great benefit to the whole. There are many small ways we can bring our daily lives into greater balance with our earth-centered values from recycling our garbage to growing our own herbs for rituals. The hundreds of consumer choices we make are each an opportunity for affecting the greater balance of the whole. But there are two errors we can fall into around consumer choices. The first error is becoming obsessive purists. In an imbalanced society, there is no way any one of us can become utterly pure. Today, my computer is powered by the sun. I've traded in my pickup for an older diesel model that can run on modified vegetable oil. I compost my garbage, grow worms, and hoard every drop of water in the summertime. But I also fly on airplanes enough that I consume far more than an equitable share of the world's resources. I do that because there's no other practical way I can do the work I'm called to do. And I'm arrogant enough to think that the work is important and justifies the fuel expended. Not everyone has the extra dollar for the organic tomatoes or the time or space to garden. Bringing our lives into alignment with the earth should not become a burdensome, guilt-filled project. Where we are constantly in an unshriven state of eco-sin, instead we can think of it as a gradual, joyful process where we look for the choices we can make that will enhance our lives. If I walk to a meeting instead of driving, I can enjoy the sights along the way and my own increased health and the exercise. If I'm too tired or rushed one day to walk, I won't flagellate myself for driving. If I can afford to replace all my light bulbs with compact fluorescence, I can replace one now and one more each time I get a little extra money. Making small choices that align with our values is important. It helps give us a sense of integrity and it gradually transforms the whole of our lives to be in better balance. The second error we can make around consumer choices is believing that those individual choices are enough to change the world. We live in a system that is currently so destructive with so many large scale destructive self reinforcing cycles at play that only collective action to change the larger system can hope to stay the damage and restore health. Let's look at a larger question from the perspective of our definitions and understandings. Let's take the issue of agriculture and bioengineered foods as posed in chapter two. 
If we were to look at the question of what benefits the whole as defined above, Monsanto's Roundup Ready seeds would be seen as a horrifying travesty. Roundup Ready seeds are genetically engineered to withstand the herbicide glycosate, trade name Roundup, so that herbicide can be applied wholesale to kill everything else that might compete with the crop. Although glyphosate is mar marketed as safe, it has been shown to cause cancer and its use destroys the living community within the soil that creates a healthy environment for growth. If we were truly interested in benefiting the whole, we'd boycott such products and instead look at ways to further organic agriculture and local food supplies, to support small farms, to make land available to more people, to bring food production as close as possible to where food is consumed. We'd understand that the vast majority of the billions who go hungry in this world are deprived, not because there isn't enough food for them, but because they lack access to it or money to buy it. Before supporting policies that concentrate wealth in the hands of the few, we'd make sure that all people have what they need to thrive. It's likely that policies like those outlined above would set off a new self-reinforcing cycle of benefits. Overall health would improve from better quality food and from a diminishment in pollutants and pesticide in the food and water supplies. Corporate profits would go down, but more real wealth and quality of life would be available to more people. City environments would improve and small towns and rural areas would be revitalized. We'll explore the issue of action toward the end of this book after we have a firm grounding in the practices and insights of earth-based magic. But for now, let's look back at the question that opened this chapter, the question that I asked the forest. How do systems change? Systems change in response to forces that disturb their equilibrium. External forces, changes in conditions, new energies and new challenges can shake up self-regulating cycles. So one way to change a system is to stir it up. That's the role of protest and direct action. And it's the reason why stronger forms of action are often necessary to bring change. Sweet reason, gentle persuasion, and dialogue that doesn't challenge the functioning of the system often end up becoming incorporated in the system's own efforts to maintain equilibrium. Change in systems often comes from the edge. The edge or ecotone, that place where one biological system meets another, is the most dynamic, most vulnerable, and often most diverse part of a system. The rocky shore where the ocean meets the land contains many more niches for life and diverse conditions for adaptation than either the sand dunes inland or the deep sea beyond. So another way to change a system is to confront it with a different system. The existence of a feminist and earth-based spirituality movement offering rituals, teaching, and community completely outside the bounds of Christianity and Judaism has had profound effects on those religions over past decades, offering support for reforms, challenges to established assumptions and practices, and creative ideas that have influenced change within the major denominations. In spite of what the forest told me, that change has to come from outside because systems by their nature try to maintain themselves, I think that systems can, to some extent, change from within. I'm not suggesting that every reader quit her job and go live in the woods. We're all part of the whole of the system. And to some extent, that opens communication and makes it possible for us to influence it. To change a drum rhythm in a group of drummers, you first have to match it and join with it. But when you are within a system, part of the whole, that system is also changing you. It is difficult to maintain your own rhythm and not simply become part of what you're trying to change. Decades ago, feminist philosopher Mary Daly suggested that the place for feminists in the academy or other institutions was on the boundaries, neither completely within nor completely without. Wherever we are, we can look for those fertile edges of systems, those places where unusual niches and dynamic forces can be found and make change there. Donella Meadows wrote a powerful essay many years ago entitled Places to Intervene in a System, which detailed nine leverage points in increasing order of effectiveness. The first two places to intervene 
changing amounts and changing material stocks and flows involve change in matter or form. If the school system is dreadful, pour more money into it or build new buildings. Sometimes those changes may be just what is needed, but they don't change the basic functioning of the system itself. Next come changes in energy flow, looking at self-regulating and self-reinforcing systems and finding ways to intervene, either to disturb a non-functional equilibrium or to establish a new equilibrium to avert a crash. Then some changes that begin to move into the realm of consciousness, changes in, the form in information flow, in rules, in self-organization and in goals. Finally, the most overarching change comes from paradigm shift, a change in the basic premises that underlie the system. We are faced today in a world of global crisis with the need for overarching change that can come only from a shift in paradigms in our basic assumptions about the world. To change a paradigm, we must be able to express clearly what the new paradigm is. That is the work of this book, to root us so firmly in the earth that we can be walking emissaries of a new whole. And that is the end of this reading for today. And that last part was really powerful to me that it's like hard because I know we're all at the end of our attention spans, but just going back to places to intervene in a system and these nine leverage points is really interesting to me to think about. Um, but we got through and I know we're short on time. I'm just going to put my questions up we're, and open it up just for reflections, thoughts, it, you know, even if they're brief so that we can digest this together. And then Diego has a couple current events and we'll try to finish out around 7 30 tonight so that we don't hold anyone too long um, but just to remind you of my questions which i will repost now kind of inspired by this last reading is um, the first question which is thinking about different patterns or principles in ecology that might be useful in helping us to guide our decisions personally and collectively um, I think Starhawk went over lots of examples of that in her um, writing. And then the next one is a little bit more maybe opaque, but I started thinking about these vast metabolic systems that are described in Gaian theory um, that happen over long periods of time. And I, and I kept thinking like, how do I remember or think about these things in my own daily life? Is there something that will remind me like the patterns based in rocks or looking at bacteria breathing out certain gases or something that will help me remember that I'm part of these vast loops that are based in deep time. Um, and I'm just wondering if you, if anyone had any ideas or thoughts around like how we can remember that we're part of this larger system really. Um, and like even visual cues or conceptual cues that we might be able to keep in mind. So um, those are my questions that I just re-put in the chat and I'll just stop talking for a minute and see what reflections bubble up. I like the idea of holes within the whole that within the broader context of the web of life, there are subsystems that are complete and functional kind of worlds unto themselves. And the freedom or I guess accessibility of engaging with a smaller system rather than feeling the need to change the whole thing at once she uses a really tangible example of light bulbs you know just switching one one at a time kind of not not sinking into despair at the enormity of challenges
I've been exploring um, my own kind of body as a microcosm of the universe in a way, as a way to understand both its edges and boundaries. And by doing that, understand what it's a part of. Um, and so recently I've been um, thinking about how um, practicing breath retention um, allows me to kind of relax into some kind of um, place where I begin to experience sensation and, and release in a way that I think probably helps me imagine deep time, like how, 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 uh, how much time it takes for a desert to form or how much time it takes since I can't experience that in human time. I've, I've tried that. And for me, the second way that I've experienced that has to do with um, silence, kind of going into um, a space like the Alabama Hills, like between big rocks in the Owens Valley, where I can't hear the electrical grid or the refrigerator or anything else. And it's as if it's a, losing a sense or losing a sense gains me a sensibility. If that makes any, any sense at all, Ooh, pun intended. So, so for me, the body as a vehicle for understanding deep time or deep space is an, is a, um, is an interesting teacher. Oh, that gave me chills, Lauren. I was like, really? But I thank you for sharing. I put mine in the chat. I don't want to be talking too loud because now there's other people in here. Sorry. Should I speak out loud your chat? I'll be the Diego voice. So imagine I'm Diego, the wonderful Diego. Something I do is try and notice every individual or animal that I can when I'm out anywhere. Not only is every individual a sensing subject that has the potential to act, to act in the same system you are a part of, but every species creates a new dimension of the system's interactions, which make it what it is and give it the ability to create more new, different sensing subjects. Understanding what organisms are doing and how they make their lives in the community system really helps me be grounded in where I am and what I value. Oof, Diego. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Just a little, yeah, reaction, wow. How, you just wrote that in like the last minute? Holy crap. Okay, that should be our motto for life. <laughs> no, 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 it's, yeah, yeah. I'm glad I asked this question because these answers are really beautiful. I'm curious about the term sensing subject, and it echoes nicely Lauren's comments about sense and using the senses as a vehicle to deeper understanding of things we may not be able to actually literally know. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot and like make you write another <laughs> answer. No, it's okay, it's okay. share a little bit about kind of deep time so anytime i go hiking or in any time i'm in a space somewhere and just kind of want to think um always kind of imagine how many people have been there in that same exact spot as me before 
and how you know it could be at in some remote places it could be a, just a handful of folks that are just, just in that exactly same spot but kind of you know imagining back further in time that you know even in the future how many people will come there and not especially when i'm in rem much more remote areas i always like to think that I'm, i'll be the first to step in that one specific patch of dirt or something but probably never i don't think that's a, a, a possible any, anymore i think it kind of helps me and um especially I, i've loved flying as a kid like uh, flying in airplanes and always always imagine when i'm up in the air just all of everyone's lives that are down below just every single individual and it kind of helps me remind myself and kind of being outside of my head and remembering that hey life is going on all around us and there's always um these people are living their lives going to place from one place to another and just kind of imagining their own kind of lives and, and how they're you know what they might be up to but it's just kind of like at a much more macro level and seeing that all kind of come to life kind of interesting to me um i i want to follow you kavi because i have a really similar I think it's really similar. Um, like sometimes when I, let's say, break a rock that has never touched air before, and I think about how I'm the first, I'm the first intentional touch on that air, maybe for you know a very very long time, or even cracking an egg, and I feel like that's the first time the inside of that egg has ever been touched before. It's 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 joining a different world um i i i tend to marvel at that so I loved both of those reflections because I can literally relate to having that reflection myself. And it's so interesting how human beings have, you know, we have commonalities in our reflections, even though it seems like so personal, but yet Kavi, you just described something that I've experienced and Roxanne, maybe Roxanne, you know, I don't know if it, I've thought of an egg, but that's like a really cool one. Um, but I have thought about touching and breaking rocks before. So it's just, I don't know, it's just amazing. Um, and uh, Diego has a, has a response. So I will read it. Diego, how are you gonna do your current events? In the... <laughs> okay, anyway, I'm gonna read Diego's response about deep time too. Seeing dinosaur fossils and birds and bird bones and thinking about all the millions of years of ecology and lives and history that are piled up in those shapes and forms. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Diego's about to post the his choices on the chat bar. Yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, those library goers need to hear about. Oh, they have to. Cards. Yeah, <laughs> you can kind of get real close and whisper. Yeah, the... if you have to get thrown out for something, it might as well be current events. <laughs> get up and give a speech about dinosaurs. Let's see what does it. <laughs> yeah. I don't care anymore. <laughs> we'll all cheer you on. <laughs> Oh, well, maybe we should, since we're getting close to our 730 uh, pumpkin hour when we yeah. turn into pumpkins. Let's Only those <laughs> hardcore people still at the bar. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> we better go for our current events, Diego. Whispered or however. Okay, cool. I'll do the current events. <laughs> okay. Um, let me share my screen. Also, I wasn't here when Kavi did the current event, so I hope I didn't pick any repeats from oh. that. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Pressure's on, Diego. Where's my, where's my Google? Your, Hold on. Your psychic abilities are being tested. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I restarted my computer. I closed my tab. Sorry. How, what a mess. Oh, no. I don't need, I guess I can just talk about it. Yeah, just talk about it. <laughs> well, okay, well, one of them was about. So I feel so bad. Sorry. One of them here. I'll talk while I do it. 
One of them was about, uh, that's too distracting, a lithium mine in Nevada. And how did, have you heard that one yet? <laughs> yeah, Kavi, Kavi already told us all about okay, that. Okay, great, great, thanks Kavi. Get, get with the bro. <laughs> um, okay, so there's the lithium one. There was the cloud cover with, with the trees. Yep. That was, no, we haven't heard that one yet. That's okay. a new one. That's a new okay. one. I, I well, posted that a, one. <laughs> it was a study that came out that was talking about how um, increased forest cover leads to more clouds um, because the, the trees create moisture in the atmosphere um, and the clouds have a cooling effect because they reduce the albedo, which is the light that's reflected. Um, they make it so that less light is absorbed uh, and the temperature um, stays low as a result of that. Um, and the, the article talked about like, um, the potential problems with like efforts to, you know, plant however many trees in one area or in a certain place, because sometimes, um, those tree planting, uh, efforts are not, um, exactly aligned with the ecology of the places that they're in. Sometimes they can tend to be monocultures or um, introduce non-native species uh, that are that become invasive and have negative effects on the, the biodiversity of the of the region. So it was just kind of a caveat of making sure that, you know, reforestation takes that into account. Um, but you know, more of what we of what we had suspected and what we could have you know, kind of guess was that um, when these systems are intact and are are doing what they normally do, then they uh, are capable of keeping our climatic system at you know what it was when they had been doing that for for a long time before we got here. Um, and the last one was about bacteria um, being able to survive for a thousand years without being fed. Do you, have you, have you, did you hear nope. it? No, okay. Kavi, well, Kavi covered it. Kavi. Oh, great. Okay. Well, you heard about the- Kavi the is so on, ahead of you on this. Uh, looking at the same <laughs> WhatsApp group. hear this one. It, okay, okay. <laughs> Wait, Kavi, what did you say? Oh, no, oh. I think Kelly was joking. Uh, we, we haven't heard this one yet. Oh, oh, oh. oh you have me. Oh, I, yeah, I actually thought we had. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, well, this one was about um, uh, the, uh, a research project that figured out that these bacteria can um, survive without being, without having nutrients, without, you know, doing their normal processes. Um, and I picked it because it was just like one that I had picked earlier, which was earlier in the, in the weeks. Um, which was about the permafrost. Um, and it really just goes to show that uh, these microbial ecosystems um, and the organisms that make them up are really capable of doing things and existing in ways that are so different from any other kinds of uh, ecosystem to groups of organisms interacting with one another. Um, and that we, we can't exactly foresee how they'll have the ability to adapt or change or, or make themselves significant in the relationships of, of new ecologies, new systems um, that are created as a result of, of, you know, what we are doing on the planet now. I hope that wasn't too, too short of a current event collection, but. Excellent. Excellent, Diego. And those library goers just got a education. <laughs> the lithium one, that, that was crazy. I, I can't believe that, you know, that that's still happening, that that's, that's something that we're dealing with now. Um, you probably already talked about it last time, but, you know, it, it, it really drives home the fact that even even green technology, even these like uh, high profile solutions to like one aspect of climate change are just fraught with 15 other problems that show that it's not 
so much a problem of how we make our energy, but what we use our energy to do. Yeah, I, I think it's also really interesting that it's so much easier to conceive of the making of a product like a battery than it is to think about its demise, like when it stops being functional, how it returns to the earth. Like it's so different from early technologies of things that are wrought from the earth and become something like a vitrified clay, then become the earth again. Um, these things, it's very hard for us to conceive of the long-term consequences of some of the things that have short-term gains. And um, I think that's the most distressing aspect of being a consumer right now of, of, of things is trying to figure out like, like, um, like we read about the educated choices and, the, and you know, how to, how to think about ecology to come back to this theme of eco meaning house, you know, and lo logical, how to keep house when the, if you think about ecosystem as a house we all live in, um, how to kind of evaluate the choices you make. Um, and one of the things that seems hardest is to think about the long-term consequences of these things we're calling innovations. Yeah, not just not just in the sense of, you know, you have this this actual object that's been manufactured and now it's going to go rest somewhere and contribute some pile of materials to some ecosystem somewhere, but also in the sense of, you know, if we continue to um, build our our lives around or or make indispensable things that require you know even at their most ecologically sustainable things that require huge amounts of extraction and um, ecological harms and contribute to I mean that that's not that's literally just to say the ecological impacts there's there's plenty of to do, to be said about social economic impacts of of accelerating our rate of resource consumption and the consolidation of wealth that comes along with it like directly tied with it um we we have to be careful that we don't lock ourselves further into something that um that we can't remedy Is also a comment on the fact that we um we are so biased towards the uncritical application of this kind of science that um, we read where the world is it's asserted that the world is systems and energy and and we come up with all kinds of terms to describe it we're so enamored we're so blinkered by that that the first uh, automatic solution to any problem is framed in terms of technology and not in terms of deep earth history, which would be the more logical and more rational route to take and science should be open to it, but science has sort of closed itself off. And so the first solution to climate change is to come up with technologies that use lithium, uh, rather than use deep earth technologies like trees, which have the uh, ability to um, do the basic uh, technology of evapotranspiration and restore the whole moisture hydrological cycle regionally and then um, over larger areas. So that's that's a bias that we uh, we never examine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, literally at this university there there's so much momentum so much that goes into training the people who are capable of making these decisions that the only way that it's it, you know it's not even up for debate what is to be done is to continue on the path and to find ways of fixing up the the ship such that it can continue never to turn course never to um you know 
stop and think about what's going on. It's always, okay, well, here's, you know, something that needs to be tinkered with and fixed so that we can continue on with the business of, you know, doing whatever we're doing. Yeah, I think uh, scientism is, is, has effectively become a religion and it's, there are plenty of academic papers that address this, how it, it has really become um, a religion. It's a, he a hegemonic dominating uh, organizing principle that nobody you know, wants to question, but plenty, but I think people are, and those are the interesting sort of um, new paradigms that I hope um, will come out of this <laughs> uh, self-termination exercise we call technology. <laughs> Well, these are really the last hardcore people at the bar. There's 10, <laughs> There's ten of us. <laughs> we outlasted them all. Uh, good for us. Okay, well, I do feel like maybe we should wrap up so we can all rest and eat and all those things. Um, but please come back next week. We'll try to keep it within within a 7:30 at the very latest time frame, and if not shorter. And that's that's well. All. This is a geological time series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. That, thank you. It's even better. Exactly. <laughs> we're exploring deep time. Yeah, we're thinking <laughs> on different time scales. We're on different yeah, time we're, scales. We're, it's all the same. It really doesn't make any difference. It's interconnected. Let's just keep the Zoom going. <laughs> I'll take you with me to eat dinner and, Let's, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're creating space trash either way, so we might as well keep, keep it going. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Probably... Probably less energy to keep the Zoom going for three or 12 weeks than all of us restarting. <laughs> Somebody has to do a small analysis of that learning and ending. We should just stay on. Keep, <laughs> keep yeah, all, that, all the energy it takes to figure out each time how to reconnect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you, could be, you could be growing tomatoes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Good night, That's everybody. Right. Good night. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Thank you Jen. Thank you, Bye, Diego. Guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good night. See you next Good week. night, everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs>